Good evening, I'm Philippe Fabri. I'm recording this short format on the 9th of March at midnight. And we learned in the press yesterday that according to a new study by the Earth for All Initiative for the Global Challenge Foundation, whose work was published by the Club of Rome, indicates, gives the results of a new world demographic simulation of population evolution previously, or at least up to now, and this is another hypothesis, we'll say, that remains valid in itself. UN estimates predicted that the world's population would continue to grow, reaching 9.7 billion in 2050, peaking at 10.4 billion in 2080, before declining slightly by the end of the century and by 2001 one person in three would be living in Africa or coming from Africa whereas currently one person in three is either Indian or Chinese which really does represent a major shift. According to this new work there are two scenarios that emerge which are supposed to take into account factors such as GDP per capita, education, health, resources, productivity, global warming and so on. Two scenarios emerge. The first imagines that the population will peak at just under 9 billion by 2046 then decline to 7.3 billion by 2100 while in another scenario the population will peak at 8.5 billion by 2040 before dropping to 6 billion by the end of the century. So in both cases we're looking at a population decline of between 20 and 25 percent by the end of the century century, which depending on the peak reached is still an enormous drop and one that's provoking reactions on social networks since for several months now we've been seeing an increasing number of articles mentioning the fact that women want to have fewer and fewer children and so on. There are fantasies that some of the world's elites want to bring about global depopulation and so on. I'm interested in this subject as part of my long-term historianomic work for one simple reason. I'm not going to go into all the details, but my work is available in books and videos that can be consulted free of charge, where I've explained the essentials of all this. I explained that since the Bronze Age, mankind has followed two great cycles of unification, a kind of globalization on the scale of the civilization of time and collapse. These lasted about one six hundred years, and the last cycle ended with the fall of the Roman Empire. And roughly speaking, these phases phases include two major phases of civilization, or at least these are the ones that frame the event. This is what I call civilizations A and B. Greek and European civilizations are civilizations A. Roman and American civilizations are civilizations B. But in both cases, these are the civilizations that tend to unify their part of the world. And so it's on this basis that I personally use temporality, even if, as we'll see, it also applies to China, for example, which is completely, or at least has been out of its depth until now, in these periods. So why is this interesting? Well, uh, it's because according to this model I've been developing over the last few years, with the domination of the American Empire over the world, we've arrived at an equivalent of what the era of the Roman Empire actually was, between the beginning of our era and the end of the Roman Empire, i.e. around the year VC, when it fell, the world's population rose to 250 million in the first century, then fell back to 200 million at the end of the fall of the Roman Empire, i.e when the fall was complete. In other words, since we don't have precise census figures, but we do have some fairly solid estimates, the drop was around 20%, which is the drop we're about to see in the world population. And what's even more interesting is when you look at the figures we've studied, in IVBC, the world population was estimated at around 150 million inhabitants, which means that it had already swollen to 250 million inhabitants, i.e. it had almost doubled before experiencing this very significant drop. And that's a very powerful statement because we're talking about a time when there was no modern medicine, when there weren't all those things that we now think have increased life expectancy and so on. But even if the Romans didn't, the population didn't explode to the same extent since it has multiplied by seven or eight since the 18th century. So here we're only two times or almost two times, but already we can see that the multiplication was, shall we say, 
on the same orders of progression in any case, i.e. E. with a very strong progression and a very strong decline. And what's extremely interesting is that all this is always accompanied by and consistent with a particular political organization. And it's all the more interesting given that once again the slightly older estimates we have, which are even harder to put into figures since the more we talk about population, the further back in time we go are getting smaller and smaller, but we do know that at the end of the Bronze Age there was the same kind of collapse in roughly the same proportion and that this collapse was concomitant with the systemic collapse of the 12th century BC, i.e. that of the great Mycenaean empires Empiritus which correspond uh, in my civilization diagram to the equivalent of the fall of the Roman Empire. In fact, it's the same phenomenon. Here again, I refer you to the videos I made on the subject. So what's extremely interesting is that these extremely strong population movements we're about to experience, which demographic projections by other intellectual means, shall we say, manage to project, correspond to what, in the same type of phase, older civilizations encountered. And what are these phases? Well, we can see that this peak in population, so to speak, is arriving and corresponds to the peak of political unification in the world. If you take the data from the study I've just mentioned and go back to 100 BC, you'll see that the world is still very divided, even if the Roman Empire is in the process of being born. The Chinese Empire had just unified, but in the space of 200 years there were practically only a handful of great empires reigning over the world, and if we were to launch a hundred we'd see a breakup whether in Asia or in the Western world. So we can see that the population peak is the moment when unification is at its maximum, and then it goes down again. So we need to try and understand this. You need to know that the peak of unification, which is also the peak of imperial civilizations, is also the peak of urbanization of urban civilizations. The great imperial civilizations, the empires that last, the empires that remain as the greatest civilizations, are also the most urbanized forms. As you probably know, urbanized life is far less fertile. The fertility rate is much lower in cities than in rural areas. And what characterizes great civilizations and the growth of cities is that in general, civilizations have cities that feed off the rural population, that draw on their population regeneration, because generally the fertility rate within cities is insufficient to guarantee population renewal. As a result, cities can maintain or grow even if they draw population from outlying areas. And yet, uh, the people who come to the city tend to have their birth rate lowered once again to match that of the city, and and this is how the cities gradually absorb the workforce, leading to a situation in which the system eventually collapses, not least because there are no longer enough people working on the outskirts to feed the system. And so, in a way, once the cities, which are a dissipative system, have consumed all the fuel, the system collapses. In our European civilizations, which are the most advanced in the world, which have been ahead of the game for 500 years, we fight against this phenomenon by attracting immigrants even outside the sphere of the basic civilization today in Europe. Because in Europe, We've already emptied the countryside, so if we want more people to feed the beast, we have to look outside. But it's the same phenomenon, and it's going to have the same consequences in the end in the outside world. If you study ancient civilization a little, particularly social mores, you'll see that among the Romans, for example, as among the Greeks, having many children was not something that was highly regarded. That was part of social mores. At the end of the Republic and during the Empire, it was generally considered necessary to have a maximum of three children, and often when there were more, they were put on display or selected so that when they were newborns, only the most viable were seen, and the others were discarded. On the other hand, peripheral populations such as the Germans, Egyptians, and Jews raised all children without distinction. And it's precisely these populations that came from the outer bangs of the empire. Nevertheless, the Roman Empire gradually suffered from the same population problems, and rather less so in spite of everything than in China, since the population of China at a time when the population of the Roman Empire had risen from roughly the population of Europe 
i.e. from 232 million to 400 BC, rose from 32 million to 43 million in the year I, roughly in the first century, and fell back to 41 million in the year V. When we talk about Europe, we're also talking about areas outside the Roman Empire, uh, i.e. Uh, places that were much less depopulated than the Roman Empire. China, on the other hand, went from 19 million to 70 million, then back down to 32 million, and an evolution from 30 million to 46 million, down to 33 million in India. So we can see that in Asia it's been even stronger, but there are more densely populated areas. Where does this phenomenon come from? Why are cities evolving like this? And why in particular are we now seeing absolutely disastrous fertility rates in certain cities or even certain extremely urbanized countries, such as South Korea, for example, which is the demographic lantern of the world, which is one of the most urbanized countries in the world and which has a fertility rate of 0,427 children, 0,424, sorry, children per woman. 0427 is Hong Kong, but as you can see, we're on roughly the same scale. Japan also has a very low rate, and we know that these countries are exposed to demographic catastrophes. Where does this come from? There's probably an effect of overcrowding that produces, in a way, a form of regulation, a self-regulating effect on the population, uh, which would be in line with the thinking of Pierre Chonou, uh, the great historian, who, for antiquity, since he observed this decline in the population of antiquity, said that it was probably due to the fact that people were having fewer children and to the idea that he mentioned of a full world. It's the concept that puts it forward, i.e. the idea that people have the impression that the world is already full, that it's not a depopulated world, that it's not an empty world like in the desert countryside, that the crowding of cities produces a kind of sterilizing effect. Calhoun's behavioral cloak experiment, which I think you've already heard about, was carried out in 2,950 58 and uh, has since had an influence on urban sociology and the effects of urbanization on social mores. In this behavioral cloak, the experiment was simple. A relatively large space was given to a rat population that was basically very small, but with an abundance of food. This abundance of food led to a population explosion and the effects are manifold a form of hyper-aggressiveness between individuals, with youngsters increasingly left to their own devices by adults. Cases of deviance, sexual deviance, with individuals becoming totally asexual, i.e. having absolutely no sexual relations whatsoever for bizarre breeds, infantile cannibalism. And finally, after a population peak, a total population collapse, it's an extremely interesting situation because when you look at it, you see that this is what's left of rat populations. So we're not dealing with great civilizations, but we're observing behaviors that are precisely linked to and particularly visible in highly urbanized societies that develop this kind of thing. Uh, for example, there's a case of withdrawal, uh, what Calhoun called the pathological withdrawal of certain rats who would only go out to eat and drink and only when other members of the community weren't around, uh, which brings to mind a phenomenon like that of hermits, which appeared and developed particularly at the end of the Roman Empire within the framework of the Christian religion. But we sense that it was linked to a kind of desire to return, to get away from these cities that were no longer perceived as belonging to man's natural philosophy. And uh, when you study this model, you're struck by the fact that these rats tended to concentrate in the same part of the enclosure, almost voluntarily attaching themselves, and thus finding themselves in an extremely unhealthy situation. That's why this phenomenon has been so interesting for studying the evolution of city population. And it brings us back to an idea, since we find this phenomenon of collapse, ultimately, in the great empires. And what characterizes the great empires is, once again, the phenomenon of urbanization. But there's another model that probably contains or explains this one, uh, this cloak model. And above all this model, what we can see as really as a form of self-regulation of large groups of living beings, which is the model of what we call life history, short life history or fast life history, also known as the RK model, which is roughly speaking, of course, it's always a spectrum. But the two ways of managing reproduction and life in an evolutionary system. 
The rapid model, the rapid life history, refers to species that make a lot of little ones because they live an extremely dangerous life, unpredictable but above all dangerous, and so there are a few individuals that survive so they don't have to live long generally, and they are obliged to reproduce quickly and reproduce a lot. Examples of this are small vermin, such as uh, voles, mice, etc., which have a huge number of predators, and tend to swarm as soon as there's an abundance of food, precisely because they're not made to live in that environment, but in environments where you need a lot of individuals, because only a few will survive, and that's how the species maintains itself. And then you have the model, which is generally applied to large species, since this model is normally applied by species, not within a species, but I'll come back to that. You have the large species, for example, if you take elephants or any large species, it's the long life history model, meaning that these are animals that are much larger, that have a much later sexual maturity, that will have far fewer offspring in their lifetime, but that take care of them, and that are generally species that don't fear many dangers, i.e. they don't have many predators, they don't fear many climatic hazards, etc. Why is this interesting? Why is this interesting? Because despite everything, even if it's normally used to explain the different lifestyles of different species, we find that humanity itself oscillates between these two lifestyles depending on the society. And it's extremely fascinating to see that, uh, as I said, in the rural world fertility is generally higher than in the cities and what characterizes the rural world and rural life uh, even more so at the time of the Roman Empire than today, of course, since technology tends to stabilize environment is that urban life is much more predictable than rural life. The seasonal cycle is perceived as less important. The day-night cycle itself is perceived to be less important and days are much more similar in the city than in the country. So these different lifestyles also tend to lead to different reproductive patterns and the urban way of life, because it's more predictable, uh, tends more towards the capitalization model, the slow growth model. Uh, in other words, the model in which we have few children and take care of them a lot, uh, which was one of the things Paulie was saying when he complained about the lack of men in Greece. He said people don't want to marry anymore. When they do, they want to have a child or two to bring them up in luxury and leave them an inheritance, which is a hallmark of urban civilization. And so it's a phenomenon we're seeing quite clearly, and I think it also explains this uh, effect of civilizations and empires I was talking about earlier. Uh, in other words, the urbanization of the great imperial civilizations means that they tend more and more to have populations that develop a way of life a long life history in which sexual or family maturity is late. In other words, people have children very late or have very few and try to bequeath them as much as possible. On the other hand, if you delve into periods such as the Dark Ages of Greek Antiquity or the Middle Ages of our own time, which are much less urbanized eras, these are also eras in which the models are to have many more children and these are also rural models. But they're not just rural models, they're also models that are politically, and this is where I come back to what I was saying at the beginning, they're models that are politically much more dangerous, much more risky, in which political stability is much lower, which inevitably also has an effect on society and on this kind of regulation, which means that, by instinct, people tend to have more children because there are simply fewer who survive. And since the universe is less predictable, it's a question of having children quickly so as to populate and ensure the survival of the species. This idea of a self-regulating model, including in human populations that are supposed to be reflexive and conscious, seems to me to be very important because it explains what we observe in these great phases, these great breaths in the demographic history of humanity, and it explains why it corresponds to the great phases of political history. And I think in particular that these demographic collapses are due to the fact that uh, the decline of empires, this phase of decline which exists since the Roman Empire at the end of the 5th century, didn't collapse overnight. It was a slow collapse with increasing insecurity, with the rise of mobile invasions, with the withdrawal of cities behind walls. And so this whole phase corresponds to an increase in danger. 
whereas the apogee of the empire was the apogee of predictability, the apogee of calm, the Pax Romana, etc., the Pax Sinica in Asia. In other words, you have populations that are truly K-dominant in an RK model, uh, whereas in extremely turbulent periods, you have populations that are R-dominant. And it's likely that the building of empires uh, by creating a more and more politically stable situation tends to tame, shall we say, to tame, to accustom populations to evolve towards a rather R-dominant tendency, towards a rather K-dominant tendency. And I think that this population collapse before the upturn, which then starts again a few centuries later, since the upturn starts again around the year 1000, you have a world population that starts to rise again, and then it increases very sharply in modern times. Well, this upturn, in my opinion, can be explained by the fact that, in fact, there's a phase of detransition from the long life history model back to a short life history from the moment populations get used to political unpredictability again to great invasions and therefore instability growing threats and growing climatic threats too since simple political dismemberment increases the climatic threat when you're in an imperial model where if you have bad harvests you have a secure route to import very good harvests that have taken place 500 kilometers away you have a much lower danger of famine whereas when you're in a system where the roads are extremely dangerous and you can't have long distance import and export if you're on able to produce your subsistence locally, you'll simply die. And so the dismemberment of empires necessarily leads to a world that is not only more dangerous politically, but also more dangerous from all the other points of view for which political unification made it possible to find solutions precisely within the framework of these large political units. So that's why I find all this extremely interesting, why I think that this phenomenon we're seeing of probable population decline is not a definitive phenomenon. I don't think we're heading for a situation in which the population of mankind goes back to being extremely low or halves and then stays there, which would be a kind of stable and permanent state in an ecological earth, which is perhaps the dream of some people. I simply think that what we're witnessing is the beginning or the first signs of the collapse of the global empire uh, that has been built up which will not collapse before the peak has been reached, but probably at the end of this century or a little after in the following century. And this collapse, which will lead to a political unraveling of the world, a redivision, a deglobalization, will effectively correspond to an increase in the danger to deurbanization and to a retransition towards a population model that will grow much faster. And uh, my conclusion is that, uh, as has been the case in the past, I think we will then enter a kind of new Middle Ages, which after a thousand years, Years probably uh, will reproduce an extremely strong population growth which will then require because it will be so vast what drove the Greeks to colonize what drove the Europeans to was this crisis the stasis the crisis in the city due in particular to overpopulation so I don't think we're there yet obviously we're about to enter a phase of depopulation which again in my opinion is perfectly logical for the reasons I've given, which corresponds to um, the great cycle of civilizations, and I thought this was an excellent opportunity to talk about it and take a step back, and above all, to show that there's little reason to panic. Well, we can. We can regret all these ideas that there are two, three, four hundred women, for example, in Western societies who say they don't want to have children. It may be distressing, it may be worrying from a human point of view. But once again, if you look at the behavioral cloaca experiment, it's quite logical. And for me, it's a collective regulation mechanism at the scales of population concentration we've reached.
and especially over time, since unlike rats, we're generally a species with a much longer life cycle, which means that naturally it didn't just take us a few weeks to reach that state, but it took us whole decades. So that's what I wanted to tell you in this short format. If you're new to the channel, don't hesitate to subscribe and take a look around to see if there's anything else that interests you. And until then, don't let me stop you.